So this in many ways is a follow up of the previous talk we had on imaging and stroke. Now, once we have understood which are the candidates who are suitable for mechanical thromectomy, we have to now plan as to what would be the appropriate approach towards mechanical thrombectomy. So I put this title saying that all that glitters is not gold, just to express the view that like all fevers are not the same and based on the etiology, the treatment would change. For example, if the patient has got a urinary tract infection, has got fever, versus a patient who's got a viral fever versus a patient who's got a fever secondary, say, to a tumor, they all present the same way with a raised temperature. But the bottom line is that they all require different ways to treat. So in the same way, we have to understand that although all of them present as ischemic strokes, we have to understand that not all of them have the same etiology. And if different patients have different etiologies, then can we treat everyone the same way? So what are the variables? The first variable that we have is the location. You can have an occlusion in a branch vessel like the MCA or the ICA uh, or uh, the ACA or it can be in the internal carotid itself at the point of its bifurcation from the common carotid. And we'll realize that they all are different and unique in their own ways as to how we approach and treat them. Now, once we have a branch occlusion, it could be an embolic occlusion, which is soft like an RVC clot, or it could be an embolic occlusion, which is relatively harder, and that can happen in a fibrin-rich clot, or it could be an ICAD, which is basically, basically intracerebral atherosclerotic disease, where what we have is a narrowing secondary to a plot, which has got acutely occluded, either because of thrombosis or more often because of a ruptured plaque. When it comes to the internal carotid artery, it can either be a stenosis, which is quite common, or an embolus, in that case, it has to be a pretty large embolus, like one coming from the LV clot, which will latch itself at the ICA bifurcation. So, we have to understand one thing, that one single device, like a stent retriever, may not have an answer for every type of occlusion we see. In other words, we have to identify what could be the underlying cause and customize our treatment towards it, and then the chances of recanalization will be much higher than blindly trying one technique for every single occlusion. So let's start with the internal carotid artery. Like we said, there are two possibilities. It could be an underlying stenosis that got occluded, or it could be an embolus that is in the proximal ICA. Now, can we really differentiate Technically, it's extremely difficult because they both look the same unless we try to do um, some imaging at that point of time, like an MR and try to find out. You know, so maybe sometimes we can't, but having said that, if you do an MR, like we talked in the previous study, one of the advantages is that sometimes you may be able to pick up a dissecting aneurysm or a dissection of the carotid artery where Taking any device can be very detrimental. So always, whenever you have an IC occlusion, always keep dissection as a possibility in your mind. If you see reduced flow in both carotids, think of dissection of the aorta as a possibility. A type A dissection extending into the arch vessels can sometimes present with stroke and be careful. Think of it as a possibility when you see bilateral watershed infarcts or one side the vessel is occluded and the opposite side also perfusion is low. So keep your mind open to all the possibilities so that you don't encounter some problems from which you cannot get out. Like for example, I said, if you have a spontaneous dissection of the carotid artery, patient has come with a stroke, you take your devices, you're gonna kill the patient sometimes. 
what he needs may be anticoagulant or trying to find the true lumen. So keep that in mind, even as you image and as you study, and don't get so focused on the occlusion that you stop evaluating the patient to actually search for an underlying etiology. Very often, when a patient comes with an IC occlusion, the picture is like this. So when the picture is like this, it's difficult to know what exactly is the underlying cause. So what we do in our center is, we have this long sheet here. We can actually keep the Neuromax like sheet or uh, any of the, uh, 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 even infinity or whatever you wanna choose uh, is pr pretty okay. As long as you decide the approach and I'm talking about devices that we use from uh, the uh, femoral route. If you're coming from the arm, by now you should have known that the best long sheet is the one that comes from BALT, which is the only one that can not kink as it take these curves. So decide the choice of your long sheet. Through that, you take a coronary wire and cross. And then after that, keep a long balloon, if possible, 20 millimeters and four. Predilate the lesion. And as you predilate the lesion, if it is a thrombus, nothing is gonna happen. If it is an underlying stenosis, you create a decent passage to allow your long sheath to track across. Now you understand this is an important step. So how do you do it? Technically, as the balloon is deflating, you take your long sheath across. The primary aim of this is to prevent snow plowing or collecting material or debris from the plaque into the long sheath and then pushing it up distally. The reason why we are worried is these plaques sometimes are difficult to retrieve because they fragment and they go into the uh, distal MCA as you do the procedure. So once you have done this, because the balloon was filling the lumen of the long sheath, the chance of collecting debris is very low. Now that you've got your long sheath across, you don't pull this down and do all your procedures through the long sheath, finally coming back and then taking a corrective measure if necessary. I hope you can understand that. It's very important to know that once you cross it, keep your device up here, complete your procedure, and only on the way back should you think about stenting. Now that is a practice we follow and we feel it's a much safer practice. Now let's take an example. This is a 58 year old male. He has come with a history of numbness in the left upper and lower limb since the morning. There is left hemi hemiparison slurring for two and a half hours technically. So it's way, very, very much in the window period of even IV thrombolysis. The power in the left upper limb is zero by five, left lower limb is one by five, the BP is 150 by 90. So we know it's fine. We are talking about a very uh, significant uh, NIH score, which definitely warrants treatment. Like I said, in our center, we often start with MR and we see the diffusion show some restriction along the lentiform nucleus, but the internal capsule is spared. There is some changes in the caudate nucleus, a little bit of changes along the, the insula cortex, and it is all on the right side. We are not too bothered because we know that the aspect score is within limits and none of these seem to be eloquent areas. We can expect the patient to recover well. This is the MR angio. Obviously, the patient is not very cooperative, but we can have the information we want that the ICA is occluded from the origin on the right side. And there is no decent reformation seen, or, uh, uh, and we do not see the MCA filling, though we can see the ACA filling from the opposite side. We cannot do a very good study of these uh, susceptibility weighted imaging because the patient has been moving his head. But we know this is an IC occlusion. And like we said, there is a little streak of contrast growing up here. Beyond it, we don't see anything at all. So what are the next step? Now, if you see here on the lateral, it's pretty clear. You can see the balloon. It's a four millimeter into a 15 mm balloon that we're using for dilatation. A 20 is even better, but we often don't have that on the shelf. You can see on the AP view, the long sheet out here, the balloon up here, and we do a pre-dilatation. After we do a pre-dilatation, we see there is some opening, but interestingly, we also see forward flow that is going up. So most of the ICA is open. Now this is a consistent finding. Very often, what looks like a complete occlusion of the ICA is probably just occlusion in the proximal ICA, 
Along with that, you may have an associated tandem occlusion in the MCA, and that's why we see filling in the ACA, but we are not seeing filling into the MCA on the opposite side, okay? So here we have the picture. You can see it, there is occlusion beyond the posterior communicating artery. Uh, it's completely occluded, you can see on the lateral. And there is some forward flow seen over here. We can see a very ugly looking uh, segment, which was the segment that we dilated. It looks like this is basically a carotid stenosis, which has got acutely occluded, probably secondary to a plaque rupture, or even sometimes a thrombus formation within the lumen, which has been compromised. Now, what has been done next? So we plan to do a technique, which is called the modified solumbra, and we will talk about that a little later. But technically, you can see we got a long sheath here. We got another suction catheter here. We got a micro catheter across it. So here is the injection we make through the micro catheter. It's important to understand. You can see all three in the long sheath. And out here, you can see the suction catheter. And when you make an injection, you see there is still thrombus beyond it. So it's extending from the bifurcation of the MCA and is going beyond. So we see that. So we take the catheter beyond it and we put the stent retriever across it. And now we have a system. We've got a suction at the base of the central retriever. Then we have got the stent retriever through it. We open this, we suck through the suction catheter. We stuck through the long sheet that is present over here. So you can talk about it. Should we have a balloon guide or a long sheet? Now, whatever matters, we'll talk about it again in detail. You have to arrest forward flow. We do that often by taking the long sheet, for example, the Neuromax or the Infinity can go pretty high up. And you can often stop the forward flow when the long sheet comes to the junction where the pictus segment becomes the cavernous segment. At least in Indian patients where the carotids are smaller, we are able to arrest flow. So that is the point. We start a suction also through the long sheath. So this is the clot that we have come out to the stent retriever. And this is the result we have got. I can see over here, there is forward flow. The MCA is open, not completely. There is still some branches not filling, but you see a significant shift that has taken place from before. And uh, so we know that we just got to go ahead and uh, take the microcatheter into the branch occlusion. And if it, is, uh, uh, if it is in the proximal segment, you can use a 4 mm stent retriever, which uh, comes from a, a solitaire 4 mm, or any of the uh, stent retriever which you feel is appropriate, and you can complete the picture and get a complete flow. So I hope you got the steps of it. When it's a tandem occlusion, it's about taking a sheath across it, and not doing anything till you complete this main procedure. On the way back, we come and we take an injection and see how things look. Now, it may look normal for the first few minutes. Your sheet was there. So never be in a hurry to come back. Wait for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Actually, we wait for 45 minutes. And we look and see now it's occluding back again. If this is the situation, you've got a stent. Now, the problem of stenting in an acute a stroke is, that means we start the patient on antiplatelets. So the best thing would be at this point of time, you give the patient a bolus of tyrofuse and we load the patient with 300 milligrams of aspirin and we overlap the, uh, the aspirin and the tyrofuse for another one hour and then we stop it. Now the reason is because we are worried about uh, a bleed and we invariably will do a susceptibility imaging after that to see if there is a bleed. Now, if there is a bleed or if you see there is some evidence of early bleeding, then it's going to be a disaster. We have to understand that's why it's good to avoid using uh, metal at the acute phase. But sometimes I see so in this case, you're forced to use it and you we use only a single antiplatelet with a very short duration of tyrofuse purely because of the worry of the bleed. And then we monitor it also by doing carotid dopplers every few hours to ensure it's patent. So it is a difficult decision to take. Post procedure, this is the SWI. You see, it has not got worse, only that now we have got a patient who is uh, 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 
was uh, ventilated during the procedure, and that's why we have got a better quality imaging. There's a few more infarcts that we see in the cortex in the frontal lobe, not of great consequence. We do an SWR and we do not see a bleed. Now that's important. So basically, we could show you the pathway that we would follow when we have an occlusion of the proximal ICA. And here, since we did not know the etiology, we follow the same pathway at all times, unless then until it's a dissection. So rule out a dissection on MR. And I feel honestly, it's a very good idea to do an MR uh, for all patients where there is an IC occlusion because CT angio sometimes cannot show the false lumen. Here we'll see a very different signal within the false lumen and that and the T1, the hypertense signal itself is a very, very strong indicator. You're handling a dissection and which is not possible on a CT. Now, when you come to the branches, what are the possibilities? You could be have an RBC clot. You could have a fibrin rich or a heart clot. Or you can have an ICAD with acute occlusion. So all three of them are possibilities. But we know the pathophysiology of all three are different. And since the pathophysiology of all three are different, the way we treat it is, has to be different or has to be modified according to the disease. Now let's think of an RVC clot. How do you suspect an RVC clot? You need a source. Most of the time it's a cardiac, a patient has come who's got an LV clot or has got atrial fibrillation. On CT, look for a dense MCA. The same thing, is represented on MR as blooming on the SWI. And because it's a clot, a clot gets invariably held at a point of bifurcation. So usually it will be seen either at the ICA top at the bifurcation or in the distal M1 segment where it is a bifurcation. So now this is classical, but you know, sometimes you have a combination what starts as a fibrin clot also will accumulate red clots beyond it. Uh, so it is not that these are absolutely true, but they are very, very strong indicators of what could be happening. Now, like I said, the most reliable sign is a hyperdense MCA or a blooming on SWI. Now, when you have an RBC rich clot and you take a device, a stent retriever across, one of the things you'll find, of course, the wire and the micro will go easily across. The stent retriever, retriever invariably will open completely because they are so soft. And it, when it opens completely, you will actually realize this is important just to ensure that the clot is entangled inside the meshes of the stent retriever. The clot is entangled inside the stent retriever. And so when you take it out, the chance of it coming is very, very high. So with the RBC clot, the retrieval is close to 100%, whatever the technique you use, even if you use isolated suction. But we'll also tell you why just a scent retriever can give rise to problems, because whatever is very easy can have its own set of problems. So how do you do the procedure? Ideally, you should be placing a balloon guide in the ICA, and you take the microcatheter across the segment that is plotted, deliver your stent retriever in such a way that the proximal two thirds, remember this, the proximal two third is across the clot. So remember, you need more of the stent retriever distal than proximal. Do not put it in such a way that the distal third is in the clot and the proximal segment is proximal to the clot. You will find that the clot will slip out. It's pretty same, simple logic. The more of the stent retriever I have beyond it, the more chances that a slip caught clot will get entangled in the mesh that is distal. So a good length is always to use a six into four or a four into four, the long lesion, a long uh, uh, stent retrievers, and they will invariably entangle the lesion. So this is how you do it. You start pulling it out and you will bring this clot into it. And it actually works very, very similar to this. Once you come close, into the sheath with the suction going, you have to ensure that suction is there at all times. You pull the clot into it. And remember, it can fragment and break and go distally. So that's why the suction component is very, very important. Now understand, as we are sucking through a balloon catheter that is placed proximally, some things can sometimes work against us. Now, if you have a very competent PCOM, the suction that you do 
is also going to flow through the collaterals. Uh, now here I'm demonstrating that you have an MC occlusion, you're sucking really hard, you're getting the flow coming from the A comp and passing through. So remember, part of your suction is now wasted because it's coming through the A comp and actually you're not having a great amount of suction actually on the clot. If you got a large P comp, you're going to get that also working against you. If you got both, you remember all you're doing is you're sucking out most of the blood from the posterior circulation and the opposite brain onto the sheath with very little effect on the clot itself. So keep this in mind because it's important about what we're going to talk after that. So the way to make it more efficient is change our technique a bit. So what happens is if your suction is not adequate, this clot that is stuck and hanging out will fragment. So what happens is that as you aspirate, it's fine as long as, as long as there is no collaterals and your suction is adequate. But if there are, you'll find that the clot actually fragments and because the suction is inadequate, you can actually see sometimes the clot is stuck over there, doesn't really come out. And as soon as you deflate the balloon, it flies off again, you know, or as soon as you actually stop the suction, flow from the PCA or the ACA will allow the clot to go to the distal MCA again. So this is a problem that we often find and we'll talk how we can avoid it. So we can avoid it if the suction is much, much higher. So let's look at a technique which is called the ADAPT or the aspiration technique. Okay, so here it is. We have a microcatheter. Now we don't cross the lesion of the microcatheter. We have the wire inside and the microcatheter. And then we will take a suction over it. I mean, the steps is first the wire, of course, then the micro, then the suction catheter. When the suction catheter touches or kisses the clot, we then take out the microcatheter and we suck. And as we suck, the clot is expected to come out. So what have we realized out of it? That suction is pretty good in taking a clot out. But we said that sometimes things fragment, sometimes they fly, and sometimes we may not be able to adequately get the whole clot out. So what could we do to improve this? Now, to go ahead uh, with the talk, I want you to also understand what are the things you require for an ADAPT. We keep an eight French sheet. Through the eight French sheet, we take a Neuromax. Remember, uh, you need an eight French for the Neuromax. It's a kind of soft sheet and it's much better. You protect it by taking it to an eight French. Uh, this need not be just a Neuromax. You can also use, like I said, an Infinity, Infinity, or you can use the ball catheter, but just check that your suction catheter matches this. Then we take a suction catheter like the ACE. Again, it's not necessary to be the ACE. You can use the React from uh, uh, Metronic, or you can uh, use a CAT6 or the CAT7 that is coming out. That would be exactly your choice and which you are comfortable with it. And in uh, with uh, the kind of results that you have been experienced with the catheter use, but ACE is definitely a very good aspiration catheter. Then we take a 2.7 catheter. I just put XLCR 2.7. It doesn't have to be that. It could be your choice. A Phenom is a very good catheter or a, a Headway 27, but you need a 2.7 catheter. Basically support the system and you need a microwire. The wire could be again a Synchro or Traxxas. Again, it's your choice, but make sure the tip of the wire is kind of a J when you're going because if you keep it as an angle, it can enter into a perforator or it can induce a rupture. You can have a problem, but once it's a J, it's a very, very safe tip. Now, this is how the system will look like. Have a look at this, right proximally, the blue one is your Neuromax or the long sheet. Through that is your suction catheter. Through that is your uh, micro catheter. Through that is the wire and you got fluid running through each one of these. Can you get this point? There's heparinized saline running to each one of these side arms to ensure that you can work, right? Then you connect your suction device through the, the suction catheter. If you do not have a suction catheter, you can connect two 50 ml syringes on a Y connector. And if you can open it in such a way that both the syringes are linked to the suction catheter and you put suction and you lock it up with a sponge holder forceps, you can get pretty decent suction even through that. And 
just want to let you know how you place your Neuromax. Very often, the Neuromax cannot go directly. It doesn't have an angle. So you take a wire into the external carotid artery, take your catheter over there. And once you have done that, I want you to understand that you will, you will actually uh, take the diagnostic catheter uh, and you will take the diagnostic catheter up so with the Y here, you have to take your diagnostic catheter up and then exchange the wire for an exchange length wire. So we often use an extra strip to make sure things are fine. And now you take the Neuromax up there and then you take it up into the, law, into the, uh, the ICA. Now you can either uh, keep the Neuromax down. I mean, uh, at this point, at this point of time, like the purple catheter, just to let you know, uh, and then after that, you can take the suction up and then take the Neuromax over it, which is a safer way. I mean, don't take the suction all the way up or if possible, you can directly take the sheet up uh, if the anatomy is straightforward. But if it's got a very tight loop, you have to change the strategy a bit. Now, how do you do the double aspiration technique or uh, what people call it a badass if you're using a balloon instead of the to the instead of using a, a long sheet like a Neuromax? So what we do here is we would take the micro across it, put the stent retriever across it, take the suction catheter high to the base of the stent retriever. So now remember one thing, you got the stent retriever open, now you've got the suction catheter at the base of the stent retriever. Got that point? It has to be clear, you don't take it beyond it, it's just kept at the base or just kissing the stent retriever then you take out the microcatheter. It is easy to take it out because the stent retriever is open. It will not come out as you take out the microcatheter. It shouldn't be a problem. If you're having a problem, there is a technique that you can use. Pull the microcatheter till the tip of the wire of the stent retriever comes into the hub. Take a 10 ml syringe, connect it to the back, inject hard on the syringe, and pull out the microcatheter. As you inject hard on the syringe, it keeps the wire in place and it won't slip out. It's important that you do the step, otherwise the suction is going to be very, very low if you have a 2.7 microcatheter inside the suction catheter. Now with that, you can take up the long sheet till the point it crosses the petrus and just comes to the point where it comes into the cavernous segment because what we find is at this point, you're much higher, your suction is much better, but more important, forward flow stops in most patients. Now, this may not be a technique that others follow, but I was talking to um, uh, some friends of mine from Michigan, and they were saying they were doing the same thing. Uh, the problem I find is the balloon catheters don't go very distal. And if they don't go very distal, sometimes the anatomy is very tortuous. I find sometimes taking the suction catheter can be more time consuming. So I feel honestly what we need is a balloon guide, which has got a two or three centimeters of a floppy tip distal to the balloon, allowing a combination of a balloon with a distal axis sheet. So once you have done that, if it's a balloon guide, obviously you inflate the balloon. Otherwise you can use the technique we use and we suck and pull the whole system into the long sheet. Remember, you're not pulling the stent retriever into the suction catheter. It's important that you understand the step. You're just sucking hard, taking the whole system out into the long sheet. Have you got this? Taking the whole system out into the long sheet now. And with this technique, your retrieval rates will definitely, definitely improve. Especially in RBC cloths, you'll find that you get it in the first pass. And the great thing is, Distal embolization with this technique is extremely low. Distal embolization with this technique is extremely low. I hope you got a concept. It's suction from two catheters, one in the long sheet or the balloon guide and another through the suction catheter and the advantage of a stent retriever. So it's like you got two nets. One safety net fails, the other one grabs you. It's as simple as that, but understand this is the best technique to get a fast recanalization and we do it at every, every case, unless and until we suspect that what we have is a fibrin-rich clot, and I'll tell you why.
Here is a 28-year-old male patient. He's come with acute onset of upper and lower limb weakness. And uh, this has been there for two and a half hours. The patient is aphasic. Look at this. You can see a dense MCA on CT. And that is a good sign. Why is it a good sign? We know that this will come out. It's going to be easy. Only thing we have to do is to ensure that fragmentation does not take place. So we do a DW aspect. You can see that it is uh, showing aspect of five, but we still want to do it because this is a kind of translucent diffusion restriction. And we have seen this translucent diffusion restriction often reverses itself. You can see the blooming on the SWI. Can you see? We can see the extension going into the branch. It is for sure uh, uh, an RBCOH clot, but it's extending into the branches. We know even before we start. Have a look on the opposite side. You can see the MCA is occluded. The hyperdense MCA is blooming on SWI. It's a distal M1 segment that is involved, extending onto the branches. What is it? We don't have a doubt. It's a red clot. So we plan with exactly what we said, the modified solumbra. So here we have uh, the devices going up. There's the long sheet. You can see. I uh, hope you can make out or you cannot make out the suction catheter. The stent retriever is across this and you suck it and you get a ticky tree in the first instance itself. And believe me, this will happen every time if this is what you see on an imaging, a hyperdense MCA, and you know that you are going to succeed because it will come out. And if you're using the double suction technique or the Varus technique, as mine calls it, you will succeed. There's no doubt about it. Okay. And the patient recovered with physiotherapy. And after some time, he came back to near normal with some uh, dysphasia, which also, as we are not dis, uh, dysarthria, which also with time will improve. So we understand that we are talking, though the aspects may look low, if it's translucent, you still will have good results. Let's look at another case. This is a 52 year old female. She's a known case of rheumatic heart disease. She comes with right-sided weakness and aphasia and hemineglect for two hours. On examination, the power in the right side is 0 by 5 and 2 by 5, and the patient is aphasic. So we know it's a red-sided, and the ECG is showing atrial fibrillation. So we know it's an RBC clot, but sometimes it may be an older clot, and sometimes technically it can behave very much like a fibrin-rich clot because it can be hard. This is the CT, we see an hyperdense MCA. The aspect over here was like eight to 10. And you can see on DWI, it comes down by at least one. And uh, so we find that it's six by 10 out here. MRA shows a left IC occlusion. And SWI, we see a clot on the ICA top, okay? So here it is. This is a clot on the ICA top. So we take the catheter micro across, like we told before, and it's important you inject and see that you cross the clot, which I talked before. And we have done a, a solumbra, and we are able to get a recandalization in the first shot itself. You can see it is good in the first pass, and you got good result. And this is the clot that is relieved. See, and you see that it's a relatively hardish black clot because of the atrial fibrillation, but you still pick it up and the two fragments are there, but the fragments have actually not flown away because of the advantage of having suction at the base of the filter. You got it? It's at the base of the filter. So the suction is very, very effective. It's not like a suction coming proximally where, like I said, if there is a communicating artery, you may lose the suction completely. Here it is. So there is no progression of infarcts. And we have a good result. The power improved three by five and uh, it will slowly improve. And by the time the patient comes back to us three months later, the modified Ratzin score will be either zero or one. And you've got back a patient doing well, which is extremely good. Okay. Now let's come to ICADs. How exactly do you suspect ICAD and how exactly do you treat an ICAD? Like I said, the treatment will be determined by what you suspect and what you see. 
check whether the patient has got a history of TIA in the past. Sudden acute occlusions don't come with history of TIAs. There will be no hypertense vessel or blooming unless and until there is a proximal uh, RBC clot which is packed upon the occluded vessel. Check if there's calcium in the vessel. Sometimes it can help. Look for other vessels carefully. Because whenever there is eye care, it's not isolated to one vessel alone. Whenever there's eye care, it is multi-vessel involvement. So if you see the opposite side showing changes, it's important. You'll see better collaterals that are seen. And usually, if it is an eye care, you will find the mid-segment of the vessel narrowed. Crossing of the lichen may be more difficult. Another finding that I've just forgotten to mention over here is check whether you see evidence of old lacuna infarcts. We have found that very reliable. If a patient has multiple old infarcts that are present on MR, it's again an indication that he has been probably throwing emboli in the past and this has got occluded now. Now, when you have an eye cat, this is a picture. There's a stenosis which is occluded. Take a stent retriever across it. You can pull it out, but the problem is a few minutes later, you'll get a platelet-rich layer that will develop and occlude the vessel because we just denuded the whole plaque and made it very, very susceptible for further occlusion because we know that this is an open surface which attracts platelets on its surface and it will occlude again. So now what is the treatment? Don't keep on repeating the procedure but start giving tyrofuse. Give a bolus of a 2B3 agent. We use tyrofuse in a center. And you will see as the tyrofuse runs, the vessel will open up again. It will invariably happen. And if there is no improvement in the tyrofuse, then take a coronary balloon or you can use a, a dedicated neuro balloon uh, like the, the balloon that comes with the credo and then you can dilate it, but dilatation is always suboptimal. Or rather, if you've got a 2.5 mm vessel, you won't dilate with a balloon which is more than 2.25. We talked on the uh, lecture on ICAT that these vessels are thinner, the muscular layer is small, and the, the um, amount of collagen fibers are fast, far, far less, and they are very, very prone to rupture and one has to be very careful. You will do use a balloon which is a little sm smaller and not match it to the size and do a gradual dilatation. And if you get a result like this, you continue running the tire of fuse, wait for at least 30 minutes, and if it is stable, come off. But if it doesn't, then you can put the stent. And we believe that one of the best stents available in the market is actually the Credo, primarily because it is easy to deploy. It's a dedicated stent for atherosclerotic disease. And if you combine it with the, the balloon, you, it is easy because you don't have to use another device. But I know people have used even the Atlas across this, but don't try to use a coronary. It's the worst stent that you can use in acute thrombus, especially in the MCA where there are perforators. So try using a self-expanding stent. And like I said, we tend to use Trido in our center. Let's show you an example in uh, the posterior circulation in a 59-year-old male who's come with giddiness and vomiting for six hours back, followed by altered sensorium and left-sided weakness, the upper limb is 0 by 5 and the lower limb is 2 by 5. Here it is. You can see the MRA and you notice there is absolutely nothing seen beyond the uh, confluence of both the vertebral arteries. You can see the cha early changes in the brainstem already present. Here it is. So when we do an angiogram, you find there's an occlusion flush at the level of the ICA, the common site for a stenosis. We take a suction catheter, we aspirate. Now the best way I feel is to use a suction rather than a stent retriever, but at the end, it probably doesn't matter too much, but the advantage is we don't denude the, the or we do not really uh, make the whole surface of the plaque extremely irregular, attracting a more thromb uh, 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 a platelet is thrombus immediately. Uh, and so we tend to use a suction if you suspect, and here it is. So that's an underlying stenosis. But then we were not very sure at that point of time, and we used the modified Solumbra technique. 
Now, because we use a solumbra, and like I said, it actually even denudes a part of the plot, the result looks far, far better. And but the thing is, look at it, five minutes later, start shutting down again. This is very, very classical. Now, for example, if you do a suction and the result looks reasonably okay, you may run tidofuse and you may be able to come up with that. If it doesn't have, if you use a modified solum, solum brand, use a stent retriever, you may get an immediate better result. There is no doubt about that. But the fact is, what will happen, it will start shutting down very soon. Now we run tidofuse here and you see we get back the vessel. The vessel is open, the result is reasonably good. At this point of time, we do not stent if it stays open like this. I told you the reason, because we do not want to run a lot of antiplatelets. Intracranial stenting would mean dual antiplatelets, higher the risk of bleed, and you can have a disastrous result. So as far as possible, try to avoid metal. So here it is, we have a stable result. We have avoided a balloon, which is a very, very good thing in the posterior circulation because we know beyond the ICA, perforators are there and you will push the plaque into the perforators and call a brainstem impact. So angioplasty was uh, not done. We were quite happy with the result and we came off. And we got the hang of it. Okay, so we did it. We realized that is occurring really fast. We know that's an ICAD, which has been uh, treated with a uh, stent retriever and we use tyrofuse and we get very, very good results after that. This 73 year old female, she's a known diabetic and a hypertensive. She gives history of recurrent TI. Remember that that is important. That is a very, very strong indicator. You are probably dealing with an ICAD. She presented with acute aphasia one hour and she's got right-sided weakness and there is the power is zero. Her NIS score is 18. We do uh, uh, a MRI, a CT aspect, so stem. MRI, you can see there is some involvement of the corona radiator, the insular cortex. There is an M1 occlusion, but you can see that it is tapering to the mid segment. Very, very important uh, finding. You look at the opposite side vessels, you can see there are some irregularities. Especially you see the PCA. Can you see the posterior cerebral artery? They look kind of irregular. These are all finding to suggest that you're probably treating or you're probably handling an ICAD. And there was no blooming on SWI in this patient. And there was some chronic infarct on the flare image. Have a look at it. You can see out here the ICA is seen, the MCA is not seen. This is the flare that shows that lacunar infarct, which I've been talking about in the basal ganglionic region. This is also a feature or a finding that kind of points towards an ICAD. Here is the picture. It's mid-segment MCA, not in the distal, more suggestive of a stenosis. It's kind of tapering. And uh, uh, so, and patient has got very, very good collaterals. Have a look at this. You can see this actually on the, uh, can you see that? The very good collateral. That means it's been there for some time. This is also a suggestion that the patient is having an eye can. Okay, I hope you're getting the hang of what I'm saying. So with these finding history of TIA, chronic watershed infarct, extensive leptomeningeal collaterals, atherosclerotic on the rest of the vessels, what do you think of? Think of an ICAD. Okay, so here it is. You can see the vessel here. We do one attempt of suction. It fails. We give uh, uh, tyrofuse across it, and you can see the very well-defined underlying stenosis, right? So we take a balloon. Uh, it's a uh, I think it's a 2.5 balloon. We dilate it and the result looks really, really good. And we wait for some time. It continues to stay open. We are happy with that. We keep the patient on a single antiplatelet like aspirin and it is much safer than putting dual antiplatelets. Follow up, immediate post push to the MR. There is no infarct progression seen and the patient actually recovered completely. Just look at it. Normal speech, power five by five, and uh, in about eight to 10 hours. And we do a CT angio post-procedure, showed no significant residual stenosis. We discharge the patient five days later, keep them on a close follow-up. And if the patient is asymptomatic, technically by guidelines, you don't have to treat the patient. So you got away without much problem, just by a balloon dilatation. Now let's have a look at another patient, 64 year old female, recurrent histories of TIA presented with left-sided weakness and aphasia since three hours. 
She's a known diabetic, hypertensive on treatment. Here it is, you can see there's multiple scattered infarcts present in a large area of the MCA. DW aspect is five, right M1, this, it's occlusion with a tapered margin, might atherosclerotic scene, changes seen on the opposite side. Here it is, so you can see the occlusion, it is starting on the mid segment. And again, in this case, can you see the extensive collateral vessels? It's not that this always is there, or it's not that in an acute occlusion it cannot happen, but these are findings that should kind of warn you what you're treating and what is the underlying cause. So what can it be? We know that from the past thing that we are thinking of an ICAD. So keep that in mind. Make sure that you already got the stent on your shelf. Tell somebody to keep things ready for treating an ICAD that can be there so you don't keep running out in the last stent. Make sure that your Tyrofuse or your 2B3A is available in the lab. And these are the things that you can do when you see something like this. So we went with an 8 prime short treat, 8 prime infinity. We are using an, uh, a, a CAT6 out here, a Headway 27, a Synchro wire, and a Solitaire. So we had a problem here because the Neuromax is causing cessation of the flow, and that's why we realized an infinity was a little more softer, and we used the infinity. And you can see that it is, this is the combination that we have. And the stent retriever is open out here, the suction catheter out here, the infinity coming round the bend up into this point. After the first pass, this is how it looks. It looks like you have kind of taken out something out and you look into the stent retriever, you don't see anything inside that. So you may ask, why did you do the stent retriever in this case? Like sometimes now we actually do the, to start with, we use the solubra even otherwise, because we realize that anyway, we will have to do something for the stenosis. Uh, especially when it's completely occluded sometime when suction doesn't work. So uh, then we find it starts occluding in no time. Have a look at it. It's completely gone. And we find in this situation an open vessel shutting down. The best thing is to start Tyrofuse right away. So we start Tyrofuse, a bolus, followed by the infusion. Post Tyrofuse infusion, that the progress of the stenosis is it looks this way we are really not we are getting forward flow but the, the the degree of stenosis has not changed so then we do a balloon dilatation with a 2 mm coronary balloon like what we showed before following the balloon look at that it immediately shuts down so there is an acute elastic recoil so in such a situation the best thing would be to put a uh, a stent. So this is the credo. It's a three millimeter diameter stent that we're using here. It is all of them come in two centimeter length. The center part of the credo has got the highest elastic recoil. The advantage is it goes through a regular uh, microcatheter, which is one seven. And so we actually use a cat five. Now you'll say, why did you change the suction catheter? The problem was the microcatheter's length. Actually, the cat five is shorter. So we wanted to ensure that we had a longer length of the micro beyond it. So it all depends on the hardware. CAT5 is a slightly shorter catheter. It's 10 centimeters shorter than the CAT6. So we use that. And then we have taken the micro across. Now this is the advantage. If you use the NeuroScout with Credo, we have used a coronary balloon here. So we had to use an exchange wire technically. And this is the result post ending. So just to tell you what we did, so you took the diagnostic catheter, I mean the 17 micro across it, uh, and then we actually treated it. So remember one thing, if you are doing an elective stenting, you have to use an exchange wire. If you're not doing an elective stenting and your wire has already crossed, probably it's not necessary, you know what you do. So we take the micro catheter with the wire, cross the lesion, pull back the wire, and deploy the, the stent through the 17 micro. But if you want to use the, the uh, I mean, NeuroScout balloon, you can use the same balloon and deploy the stent through the lumen of the, the, the wire of the NeuroScout. And if you want to know more about how this techniques of the stenting is done, do listen to that lecture on ICAT. But basically, I hope you got the hang of it. You dilate, the results are poor, you stent. So following that, the results are good. And this is actually the, uh, the post-procedure result. There is no bleed. 
when the patient does well. So you understand that this is the last option. You start in an ICAD with a 2B3A after the suction or the stent retriever, followed by balloon dilatation. And only if it fails and after waiting for half an hour that you put a stent retriever. And like I said, once you put a stent retriever, you had to run the tyrofuse for a couple of hours. We run it for about four to five hours. And we also start the patient on dual antiplatelets and we stop it. Now this protocol changes from people to people. Some people run tyrofuse or 2 b 3 for 24 hours and overlapping in the last couple of hours. We run it for about four to six hours primarily because we had some disastrous bleeds and after that we became very, very careful and we somewhat tried to keep the tire fuse running short. Of course, in this patient, we had an advantage. The stroke was just uh, uh, one hour and so it was technically a very, very well-preserved brain. The last is the fibrin disc clot and probably technically sometimes the most challenging. <clears throat> so is there a stenosis like a valvular stenosis? And or is there some plaque that has kind of ruptured and some fragments have gone up? So you may not be sure. It's also very similar to in the distal MCA. Very hardly do you got to get a fibrin plaque large enough to occlude the ICA. There will be absence of blooming and uh, 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 on uh, in the MCA or in in CT or MR. I mean the CT of course it's hyper dense and in MR it's it's a blooming that you would expect to see. Underlying vessels will be normal, collateral will be poor, and when you put the stent retriever, they don't fully open. You'll always find, but that is if the stent retriever is basically really opaque. After you remove, the vessel occludes immediately and nothing will be retrieved on the retriever or the suction uh, when you take it out. So have a look at it. So just to make you understand what happens. So have, if this is it, when you take a stent retriever, what happens is this fibrin rich clot is only pushed to one side. It doesn't engage this fibrin rich clot. That is something that you got to understand. That is where we have problem. So when I pull it out, this is what happens and it just comes back in no time at all. So in a way you may think that, you know, maybe this is an atherosclerotic clot because it is shutting down. But you understand, if you look at the overall picture, you can suspect a fibrin rich clot Nothing will be there on the stent retriever. It shuts down almost immediately. Actually, if you suspect a fibrin disc clot, a better device is a suction. So the suction only sucks. It doesn't have to actually retrieve or shouldn't get entangled into the clot. So it's important that we understand this very, very clearly. Because otherwise, you keep on trying, trying, and every time you drive these devices across, you injure the endothelium. And when you injure the endothelium, one of the problems that take place is that it itself becomes a nidus for rethrombus. So one of the techniques that you can do is this, which we found very, very good, is to take the stent retriever beyond the occlusion and then bring it back. And then it might grab it and bring it out. This is a 53-year-old male, 2.5 hours of onset, slurred speech, facial fallacy, and I just 22. Aspects of nine, there is no hyperdense vessel. It's very obvious out here. And you can see there's a large perfusion defect out here. There is some changes seen in the caudate nucleus, a very large penumbra on the ASL, and there is an occlusion of the M1 segment. So it's an occlusion out here. You can see this. Now we do a suction with the ACE, and like I said, purely going by the CT, or purely going by the CT and the MR, where there's no blooming, there is no hyperdense vessel and we get a tiki three perfusion, and this is what we get. I hope you're getting the idea how you can use imaging to try to give you a very good idea what you're treating, and you may actually find your whole process of treating stroke a lot more simplified. And this is a very, very hard clot. This is like a rubbery clot. This doesn't fragment, and so it comes out, if you're lucky, if the suction catheter is able to grab it and suck it right inside. Otherwise, of course, it may not happen. And there was Im immediate improvement and the patient was discharged. Sometimes if you pull it out and there is a residual clot remaining, uh, you may still have to give a tyrofuse, but most of the time you can get a good result if you're lucky and the clot is not very old. Here's another patient, 60 year old female, left-sided hemiplegia, aphasia, one hour of onset. CT again does not show a hyperdent vessel. MRI shows some diffusion restriction. Angio shows an occlusion in the M1 segment. There was no blooming on the SWI. 
we do an angiogram and we find a very funny looking picture like a near occlusion in the distal MCA. We do several attempts of all the techniques and it keeps on closing down. And then after, this is what happens. We do it and then it looks good and it starts occluding in no time. Sometimes you're in a confusion. So you would actually try to do uh, a tidal fuse here. So we run tidal fuse followed by infusion and the check angiogram at 45 minutes, it's open. So you say, how did this work? So very often, this is a plated rich clot. So tidal fuse may help, even though it's not an ICAT. So one thing, like I said, is you tried these techniques, it's still failing. Tidal fuse is a good way to start. If it works, it's great. And in this case, tidal fuse did help because it just one hour old. We had a fibrin rich clot and it was successful. And a follow-up in this page was pretty good. So to make you understand, Trying the stent retriever beyond may not always work, but still in this case, if everything fails, tyrofuse may still do a job if the clot is not too old. Like I said, sometimes when everything fails, one of the ways to do it is to go beyond it. 42-year-old fail, she's a known case of rheumatic disease on warfarin with poor compliance. I mean, that means she's not been really taking the drugs regularly. She presented with left hemiplegia, ECG reveals atrial fibrillation, CT outside, no bleed. She has given flexane, levipril, emicet, and she comes to us. You can see it's the infarct that is across the internal capsule. And so even if you do a great job, sometimes power may not return. You can see it's an occlusion that is gone from the ICA top, but there is a pretty large penumbra that you can see on CT perfusion. So we wanted to give it a try. So you can see it's an occlusion at the ICA top beyond the PCOM. We do a triaxial combination with an ACE 68, uh, 27 microcatheter, a Traxxas ES being navigated. And we take a solid air center retriever across it. What do you find? Nothing. There's no benefit at all. But this is six hours with old patient as atrial fibrillation. We know even if you cannot term it as a fibrin rich clot, the clot may sometimes be very, very hard. So we take the device beyond, like what do you think, beyond the clot. And the stent retriever was deployed distal to the lesion, beyond the site of occlusion. And we get a hard RBC clot because now as he pull back, it just captured within the basket. It's a very interesting thing to think. Instead of trying to get it entangled into the basket, now we are trying to get it into the basket or into the lumen of the stent retriever as we come out. And then it generally doesn't escape out. And here we got the vessel open. So that's the end result. As you can see, we got a pretty decent result at the end of it. Now, also there is a problem. Now, when we talked about this, it can sometimes slip. So though it looks open, we find as we coming out, we take this injection through the long sheet. Actually, I know it looks a little funny, but uh, we did it before we got the whole thing out and we find that it has slipped out. Now this can happen. And then you can do an solubra and you can get out. So sometimes small fragments will slip out right at the last moment and you can end up doing it. Uh, it may even fly up from the sheet in the bottom and we could treat the patient successfully. And there was speech improved, the power was still low because of the involvement of the internal capsule. And we started the patient on heparin and uh, there was a small hemorrhage. So we withheld the, uh, the aspirin and the uh, heparin, but she didn't get worse. At the time of discharge, power was still low because of the internal capsule involvement. Speech is completely normal. And uh, I've not seen her after that, but I'm sure she'll improve further and she may be able to function near normally. So just to let you run through the many, many permutation and combination that you can have and to plan your treatment appropriately based on what you expect to find. If it's an RPC clot, no problem. A solumbra and using a, a double suction technique will always work. When you have an ICAD, remember, make sure you have the other material available in your lab. So often you are going to see reocclusion. Tyrofuse works. If it doesn't work, angioplasty, if that doesn't work, stent. I said the most complicated ones are the fibrin-rich clots because sometimes nothing will work. 
and sometimes the scent retriever going distal and pulling out my work, or sometimes it can be tyrocuse that works, but at least you can know the options that you have because on the CT, you, you did not have an hyperdense MCA and on the MR, there was no blooming. So I hope it kind of takes you through this pathway. I hope it's been helpful for you. A lot of it is what we learned from our experience and the listening to others on their experiences. So this is just a kind of, uh, a, a kind of uh, a package that uh, we are presented to you, hoping that it will help you work better. And uh, do subscribe to the channel if you uh, like the presentation, because you'll get updated upon all the lectures that uh, we plan to give to hope your hope, with the hope that it helps you practice better. And if you like it, do pass uh, write a comment or do let us know. Uh, the kind of experiences you had or something new that you have to offer so that we all can learn together. Thank you.